Now, how is everyone today? Good? Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, let's see. Today's what? The 31st. <laughs> So, any questions about last time? Any questions about last time? Oh, yeah, that was the exam. Yeah, I was trying to remember what we were doing last time. I couldn't, rem I couldn't remember. <laughs> we had an exam. <laughs> okay, well, fine. Any questions about a week ago? Okay, so then let's continue. So, now we're in uh, chapter three. And specifically, we're in uh, section uh, 3.1, which is called uh, Manifolds, which is kind of a scary name, only in the sense that it sounds special, and it, this may be one of the first times uh, you've heard it, but <clears throat> I want to I try to convince you today that it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So here, here's, an interesting, uh, here, here's an interesting fact about the universe we live in. So uh, we appear to live in a four-dimensional manifold. That's, that's where apparently all, all events in the cosmos take place. Uh, so three, three uh, in, in a sense, depending on your, your frame of reference, three of these dimensions are singled out as space-like and one of them is time-like. Okay, so uh, four-dimensional uh, manifold. That's, that's, that's where we live, in the four-dimensional space. Um, but there's, there's a physical theory called string theory, and then, you know, if you, pay, if you pay attention to that kind of thing, then the string theorists sort of contend that, well, actually, we live in what, what, at least what dimension manifold? Does anyone know that? Eleven. Yeah. So the string theorist would have would, would say that oh well actually it, we probably live in in an 11 11 dimensional space. Okay. <clears throat> well, we're all waiting to, to for <laughs> for for the string theorist to sub substantiate that. Uh, fine. So I'd like for you to consider uh, uh, imagine uh, a little ant walking around on a plane. And this ant uh, is just a normal creature, and it doesn't have any wings, so it can't, it can't leave. So for all intents and purposes, what kind of universe does that ant live in? A two-dimensional space, because that's how it's able to move if it's walking around on a plane. But if we're watching it, if we're watching this ant okay, in space now, then then we live in a three-dimensional space and we can watch this ant walking around on, a, on what is to the ant a two-dimensional surface. Okay, so it's, it is like there's a two-dimensional thing sitting, side, sitting inside of an ambient three-dimensional space. Okay, so the, the, it, it, in a sense, the, the, part of the part of the physical theory of the universe, it, as, as the string theorists would have it, and I'm sure I'm but butchering it entirely, but more or less, uh, we live in kind of a four-dimensional manifold that's, that's sitting inside of 11-dimensional space. Okay. I hope they get that figured out one day. I'd love to know what the, what the, what the facts are. Um, <clears throat> so, here we go. So specifically, we're going to make a, a table it's going to be three by three. A three by three table. <clears throat> and in it, we're going to, uh, in, in a sense, specify the kind of sets that we are interested in discussing. 
Okay, so then the the uh, the columns will be uh, will be in a sense the the universe, and then the rows will be the particular uh, world that we reside in. And we're going to consider uh, a, a one-dimensional universe, a two-dimensional universe, a three-dimensional universe, and a one-dimensional world, and a two-dimensional world, and a three-dimensional world. <coughs> and in, in, each, in each cell in the table, uh, we're going to say what kind of sets we're interested in. Because there's all kinds of sets. But we're, gonna, we're, going to, we're going to specifically uh, focus in on certain kinds of sets. So one-dimensional universe, this is the real line. This is the real line. Uh, and if you have a one-dimensional subset of, of the line, uh, the specific kinds of one-dimensional subsets that we're going to be interested in are the open sets and also the compact sets. That's what we're going to be interested in. So, uh, open sets and compact sets. So, specifically, we'll be interested in things like, you know, little bits of interval and, uh, well, if you happen to have both endpoints also, we will be interested in those kind of things too. Okay, and we'll be interested in, in unbounded sets. Uh, for example, the, 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 the unbounded set that consists of all numbers more than five. Okay, we're going to be interested in, in that kind of thing. Okay, now, uh, this particular one doesn't make any sense. Why does this one not make any sense? Right, so this is, this is too much. You can't have two-dimensional... Uh, worlds sitting inside of one-dimensional universes. So this, this one's just out. This is not, this is not part of it. Uh, similarly, can you see some others that are just not part of it? Yeah, this one. And what else? This one. Right, the diagonal. Okay. So now... Continuing with the with the easy easy mode, uh, how about two dimensional uh, two dimensional uh, world sitting inside of a two dimensional universe? Again, we're just interested going to be interested in the open sets and the compact sets. That's what we're interested in. So everything on this diagonal is we're going to be interested in open sets and compact sets. Okay, so can someone give us an example of an open set in R2? Yes. Okay, so I've got to be a little bit careful because circle means, cir 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 well, circle means just the bit that you draw with your pen. So I, I take it to mean you mean all the stuff inside. Yes. Okay, so the name for that one is disk. Okay, or ball. Okay, so, you know, something like this. So all that stuff in there, uh, that, that's, that's a prototypical open set. Uh, and then uh, what, what, what's an example of a compact set in R2? What, what are the two things that you need for compactness in finite dimensional Closed RNA? And bounded. Closed and bounded. Okay. So, you know, we, we could take this and just include the boundary, but just, just so there's something a little bit different, I'll draw a rectangle. Okay. Then con continuing this, this easy mode uh, discussion, uh, it, the, the next easy one is, is three-dimensional uh, world sitting inside of three-dimensional uh, universe. What's, an, what's the prototype example open set? 
There you have it. So uh, the, the, the ball of radius one centered at the origin. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, I've, I've, in, in all my time, I've, I've never figured out how to draw an open ball, a three-dimensional one. I don't know how to, I don't know how to do it. So, so I'm just going to say that this one is open. And you'll just have to use your imagination, imagine real hard. Uh, then, so this is an example of an open set. Uh, a a, a three-dimensional open set in R3. What's, a, what's a, uh, an example of a compact set? Sorry? Right, okay. So a, a parallelogram. This is the best I can do. So this is this is uh, compact uh, three parallelogram. Okay. <clears throat> Fine. So now we're done with the easy ones. Now we got to get to the to the to the slightly more complicated variety. So now we want to consider what would a one-dimensional world sitting inside of a two-dimensional universe look like. Well. Uh, you actually know just unbelievably many of uh, such, such examples. So an example would be, say, uh, this, this parabola. So you draw the parabola on the plane, okay, and I want you to imagine now that uh, you're just a little bitty creature living in the red world. Okay, and, and you're, not, you're not aware of, of the world outside of the red. Do you observe that if you were right here, if you were right there, then, then and you're incredibly tiny, locally, locally, uh, this would look flat to you. It'd be just like being on a copy of the real line. So this is a one-dimensional world, if you like, sitting inside of a two-dimensional universe. So the physicist's point of view is that we're sitting inside of a four-dimensional, we're, we're sitting on a four-dimensional one of these, but, but it's inside of an 11-dimensional something or other. Isn't that lovely to think about? Okay, uh, another example, another example. How about, uh, how about this one? Okay, so, uh, well, with the exception of the endpoints that I drew right there, if you're away from those endpoints, if you're away from them, uh, then the world looks flat to you if you're small enough. Okay, and, and in particular, it's going to look like the world will look like a copy of of uh, the real line. So this is another one-dimensional uh, one, if you like, a one-dimensional world sitting inside of a two-dimensional universe. Okay, good. Now, I, I purposefully drew this swirly swirl thing so that it couldn't possibly be a function uh, in, in the college algebra sense. Okay, it's not a function, if you like, going that way, and nor is it going that way. But this is still the kind of set that we're interested in. Okay, good. How about a uh, one-dimensional uh, world sitting inside of a three-dimensional universe? What would that be like? Like a spring. Okay. <clears throat> so. So here's a little three dimensional axis. Uh, and then let's say that we, uh, we start here. Uh, well, we'll start here. Start here. And then. Uh, Go up and then behind the z-axis and then around and then behind the z-axis again and then around, etc. So is that showing up? Imagine a coil spring, but I cut but I but I cut the ends of it. So again, if you're a if you're a a little creature living in on the red world, 
if you were to attach the, if you were to be really small right here, then, then the world would look flat to you. Even though if you were to travel what appears to be in a straight line for you for a long time, uh, in the ambient universe, you'd be going, from our point of view, up. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay, how about a two-dimensional world sitting inside of a three-dimensional uh, universe? What would that be like? Like a plane. A plane is a good example. Um, another example would be something like, uh, how about this shape? So this is a stylized shape. For those of you that are math majors, you'll start seeing this shape a great deal. So this is a stylized thing. Does, does anyone know what this is supposed to be? A torus, right? A donut. Uh, but, but uh, understand that I'm not talking about. It's not. A, it's not a full. It's not a filled donut. It's not the. It's not the stuff that's inside of it. It's just the surface. Just the surface. Okay, uh, another example that's also really common is this one. Which is like a, like a torus a little bit, uh, but you could think like you poked a hole in it and then kind of spread that hole out. Uh, and, and that little edge bit is missing. So this is called a handle. For reasons that I'm not even going to begin to go into. Uh, this, this right here is you're seeing, in, in a sense, the, the inside. Like, like you're looking inside of like a balloon. You can see the inside from this angle. Okay, good. Any question about uh, this? Notably, I'd like for you to uh, observe that, uh, well, let, let's give an example of one that's a function. How about, uh, how about just the, the top half of a sphere, uh, some, something like this? So that, this one is a function of, of the plane that's underneath it, uh, but, but these two aren't functions, but nevertheless we're interested in them. What I want you to observe is that if you were walking around on the torus, if you were walking on ar around on the torus and you're really, really small, then locally, locally to you, it would look like a plane. Just like when you're out in Kansas, uh, the world looks flat. So any question about these, these kinds of things? Yes? So we're discussing the sets we're interested in, right? Yeah. Are we saying we're interested in all sets in uh, Universe 2 that are in World 1? I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't follow your question. As in, what would be something that doesn't fall, that's in that dimension, uh, in that universe? That ah, okay. So, uh, a non-example, a non-example non uh, for this one, say, would be, uh, well, one of these, right? <laughs> so, th so this is not a one-dimensional thing. Uh, so, you know, another non-example would be something like, if it was, you know, if it was just some normal, nice plot, and then you come down here and it, and it, gets, and it gets fat right there. And so that, in, in a sense, if you were a little creature and you were over here, then it would look like a one-dimensional uh, world, but then if you somehow wandered over here, then suddenly the universe would open up. So it's one of the fulfills universe to world one or five. Right. I, th I, think we're, I think we agree, yeah. Other questions? Okay. So, a one-dimensional world sitting inside of a two-dimensional universe, a uh, one-dimensional world sit in, sitting inside of a three-dimensional universe, two-dimensional world sitting inside of a three-dimensional universe, etc. So, what these ones on the diagonal are, what these ones on the diagonal are, they are one-dimensional worlds sitting inside of one-dimensional universes. Okay, and two, two inside of two, and uh, three inside of three. <coughs> Okay, so definition.
definition of graph. Uh, <coughs> the graph of function from rk to r in minus k uh, is the set so denoted with this symbol so I'm going to define this in just a moment but before I before I define that would someone please remind us what that symbol is this is yeah in Greek this is the uppercase gamma it, it isn't that's just a uh, so that's that's uppercase gamma, and then what 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 is what is the phonetic equivalent in English of of gamma? G. -H. G okay, very good. So I'll go with G, okay, which which is the first letter of graph, right? Which, so I'm just letting you know. Oh yeah, this isn't just some arbitrary choice. Gamma. Okay, uh, it is defined as uh, the is defined as the set uh, of all x f of x uh, in, I'm going to leave this, I'm going to leave that blank for a, uh, for a moment, uh, such that x is in our thing. Okay. So now, what I mean by this, uh, uh, remember, uh, if you like, to, that x is a column vector. So, so the inputs are, are column vectors, and the outputs are also column vectors. So this is like a stacked uh, column vector, one on, one on top of the other, to make one big, tall column vector. So uh, if, w if we take the input column vector and the output column vector and stack them and make one big one, then, then what kind of thing is this? So in particular, how many components does that one uh, produce? K. This is k of them. And then how many, how many is this one? In minus k. So, how, so, so where is this sitting? In Rn. OK, so this is the definition of, of graph. So for example, Uh, we could have f uh, from reels to reels given by f of x is x squared. Uh, then the graph of f is the set of all uh, x, x squared, uh, which is in R2 such that x is in the reals. OK, and then if you were to plot every single point that is in, that is in the graph, then what would you see? Parabola. So notably, I'd like for you to, to uh, observe that graph is a set. OK, so you've got to be a little bit, a little bit careful. So v very often, at this point, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a math class, you might, have, you might have it in your head that a graph is a picture, but it's not. A graph is a set. Okay, and then what's, what, is, what is the name for the picture? Not, not, <laughs> not a graph, yeah? A plot. A plot. So you can plot a graph, okay, but a graph is a set. So, so I could ask, for example, so I could ask, um, I could ask, is, is it the case, is it the case that uh, 3, uh, 9 is in, is in the graph of f? So, it is, so this, this is a predicate. It could be true or false. Is, is it true or is it false? This is true. Okay, uh, I, could, I could also ask, how about uh, for, um, you know, w whatever, 10? Uh, so taking, taking this to be a predicate, is that true or false? 
That's false. Okay, and then, then uh, the the way that you the way that you s see this with a plot is that if we were to plot every point in the graph, then the first question, the first question, you could have said, well, where is 3, 9? And then you, you'd, you would have found it, and it would be right here. And then the question is, is, is this, this green point right here, did, did I, is it, is it part of the redness? It is. So 3, 9 is part of the graph. Whereas if, if I draw 4, 10 right here, say, and then ask, well, is 4, 10 part of the red world? And the answer is no. Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay. So uh, this red, this red would be a one-dimensional world sitting inside of a two-dimensional universe. We're going to have better, I'm saying world and universe currently, uh, but we're going to have specific words for them in a moment. Okay, different example. How about, uh, how about f of x and y is, uh, say, the square root of a squared minus x squared plus y squared, uh, and for some fixed, some some fixed positive a. Okay, then the graph of f would be what? Would be the set of what? So x, y, and then all that business, right? Yeah. So this would be in R3, uh, such that, well, we've got to be a little bit careful here, x, y in, uh, in R2 can't, couldn't possibly be all of them. Why could it not possibly be all of them? Yeah, because of the square root. Uh, so in the natural domain of f. Okay, and if you were to plot the graph of this f, what would you, uh, what would you see? Yeah, you see half, half of a sphere is what you'd see. Okay, so, so in, 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 ooh, look, I have unbalanced parentheses. Shame on me. Look at that. Uh, so if, if x squared plus y squared is too big, so for example, if a is 1, just to, just to be definite, if a were 1, then this would be 1 minus something or other. If x squared plus y squared got too big, then you wouldn't be able to do it, right? So if you were to plot this, it would look like this. So the only, the only place where you'd actually be able to do it is, is you could come out here to, to uh, y is a, all the way back here to uh, x is negative a, uh, positive a, and y is negative a. And you'd only be able to plug in things that are in x, y values that are in this disk. That's the only place you'd be able to do it. And then what you'd see, if you were to do that, you'd see the top half of the sphere. OK. So uh, what kind of world is this? Uh, the, the dimensionality of it? It's a two-dimensional world okay, sitting inside of what kind of universe? A three-dimensional universe. Good. So any question about this <clears throat> kind of idea? What is this? Okay. 
One last one. I'm sorry? So, so I think I think you're saying I remember us talking about K form on our end, and you're you're definitely picking up on something, but it's not quite the same. What what what? Just for matter of foreshadowing, what what we're going to do is if we're if we're dealing, for example, in this case, a two-dimensional world sitting inside of R three, what we'll do is we'll take uh, that two-dimensional world and then break it up into little pieces, and then the little pieces are going to be you know, to anthropomorphize it a bit, eaten up by, by a two-form on R3. Okay, we'll break this, this world into little bitty two parallelograms that are sitting inside of R3. Good. Uh, one more. I lost my pencil. <clears throat> so, for example, how about, um, let's not use F again. Because uh, not everything's called F. How about uh, phi? <laughs> Don't want to venture too far, right? Uh, phi of x. So that's that's funny because that's the ph Greek F. Right? Uh, <clears throat> so how about phi of x is uh, say uh, four cosine of x in the first component and how about, uh, I don't know, 3 sine of x in the second component? <clears throat> okay. Then uh, please tell me if that's the case. Then what is the graph of phi? Yeah. Okay, so it's the set of all of all. What what is what are the tuples from top to bottom? X or cosine x, three sine x. These are sitting inside of R three. Uh, x is in R, uh, just R. So now, what kind of world is this? What, could, what is the dimensionality of this world? One. One. Uh, but what kind of universe is it sitting inside? Three. So if you were to plot the graph now, if you were to plot the graph, and if we were to take the components uh, in, in, in their usual order, that this one is x, y, and z, and if we plot, if we plot, uh, if, if we draw the axes also in the, usual configuration. Uh, would you please remind me, uh, which, which one is the x-axis? The one coming out at us. Uh, and then which one is the y-axis? To the right. And then z's up. So what, what will the graph look like? What's it going to look like? A spring. I agree it's a spring. No, no objection. Uh, yeah, it's going to be coming. It's going to be coming out. It's going to be coming out. So if if we were to momentarily uh, take take this take this axis, grab it, and just turn it a little bit so that we're looking straight at the x. So the x was coming right out at us. So that we could only see y and x. Ah, sorry, I mean y and z. Then what would we see if we did that? Not a circle. An ellipse. We'd see an ellipse, uh, and specifically, would it, be, would, it be, uh, squ would it be squished this way or squished this way? It, it, yeah, the, 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 the first coordinate, th this one would be 4 going that way. And then the second coordinate would be three going the other way. So if 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 you were to look at it with ec with the x-axis coming right at us, you'd see an ellipse that looks like this. Uh, th these would be its extent. Uh, and if you were to just watch the particle tr tr tracing this out, would this particle be 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 going 
uh, from, our, from x coming out clockwise or counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. So it would look like this. So you'd see it going like so. Okay, so now that's, that's, if, that's if we uh, have, have, in a sense, killed the depth and we're looking straight, straight down the x-axis. Uh, but if we're looking at it in, in perspective, then uh, we'll say that, okay, this is, this is 4. Y is positive 4. So that this over here is negative 4. Then we could say that this is Z is 3. And here is Z is negative 3. And what we would witness uh, is it would start on the y-axis here at 4. So it would start here. X is 0. And then it would, it would come up and then hit that right there. It would hit that one, that topmost point. There it is, uh, and then it would then it would go down and hit that one right there, and then it would. Uh, let's see, where am I now? I'm at the top left. This one is the bottom, so it would come down, hit this bottom one right here. Okay, then then come back around, and and hit this one right here. Hmm. Not an artist. I'm so sorry. Uh, so this is one one full rotation. Then you'd see it continue uh, going going like this. I hope I'm not ma making it much worse. Okay, so good. So locally, if you were a little ant walking around in this world, it would look one-dimensional. But then, if you if if we have our you know om omnipotent. Uh, point of view, if if the, you can see that as the ant is walking in its one-dimensional world, it's also in a sense making progress going this way, which is interesting. Okay. How did you know it was not a uh, Because uh, because uh, if 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 you were to start say with x is zero, then at at x is zero, that's where you'd be. Uh, at x is 0, this is 1, so that would be 4, and that would be 0. So 4, 0. And then if you increase x just a little bit, uh, then, then you'd start going that way. Yes. OK. So now that we have that, we have a definition. This is the definition of a smooth manifold, uh, a smooth K manifold. I need to put a K prefix on that. Uh, embedded. Okay, so a subset M, a subset of Rn, uh, is called one of these, a, a smooth K manifold embedded in Rn, uh, if for all Z and M, There exists epsilon greater than zero uh, such that uh, M intersect the ball of radius epsilon centered at Z 
is the graph uh, of a C1. rk to rn minus k function. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it's a math definition, so it's tip, 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 typically not comprehensible. So let's, let's try and, and understand what, what it means. Okay. So let's, uh, let's start out uh, with, with something that's uh, fairly innocuous uh, and to totally comprehensible to us. How about just a circle? OK, so in, in particular, uh, I want this circle to be sitting inside of uh, R2. So some, some circle in the plane. <coughs> Doesn't matter where it's centered. I'm just drawing the origin away because otherwise it would, uh, it would interfere with what I'm going to try to draw. OK, so just this blue set alone, not the, not the stuff that happens to be inside, just the blue set, just, just the, the line, the curve. Uh, this is M. So here's what I want you to uh, observe about this M. Take, for example, this point right here. I'll call this point uh, Z1. So now around Z1, around Z1, I'm going to take a ball, this ball, and uh, this ball <coughs> is going to cut all the way through R2. So this is uh, a ball of radius epsilon 1, just 1 because that's Z1, uh, centered at Z1. Now, what I want you to uh, imagine is that we, we have this circle and then like, like an ice cream scoop or a very sharp scalpel, we take this, we take this ball and, and cut away just that piece and we're going to examine it uh, very closely. So here's my, here's my manifold eyeball here. That's, a, that's an eyeball. Uh, <clears throat> if, you were to, if you were to do that, uh, then what you would observe, because that's an open ball, you'd see a little piece of M that looks like this. More or less. That's what you'd see. So this little piece of M, it is, it is itself sitting inside of R2. So I'm going to, just, just to remind you of that, of that being the case. Uh, I, I'll draw another, another axis. And do you, do you observe that this piece right here, this piece, what is the, in a sense, what is the formula for this piece? Or what does it have to do with this definition? Right. That, that's what this is saying. It's saying, take the, take the big blue world that you're interested in and cut away a piece of it with the ball. So what this is, this is M intersect the ball of radius epsilon 1 centered at Z1. And what I want you to observe that cutting this piece away, cutting this piece away, it's now a function. It, it, can, be, it can be understood as a C1 function. Okay, now to make sure that we don't get too, uh, too, uh, too confused, I'd like for you to observe how about... Uh, how about this point on the side? How about that point on the side? That's supposed to be, it's supposed to be a circle, and that's supposed to be the, the leftmost point. So if we call this Z2, and then we, we cut out, uh, we cut out uh, a ball, 
we, we, well, we use a ball to cut out a piece. And if we look very closely at, at that, with our manifold eyeball here, uh, then we'd see something that looks like this. And this is, this is exaggerated. Okay. Again, this is some kind of piece that's sitting inside of R2. This is M intersect the ball of radius epsilon 2 centered at Z2. Now, is this piece a function? So, now, my, so, it's a loaded question, what I just asked. So, my question is, is, is it possible to represent this as, as, as the graph of a function? Yeah, but not, not in the college algebra sense. Okay, you couldn't, you could not represent it as a function of x. But, but that's, not re that's not relevant. That you, couldn't rep you couldn't represent it as a function of the horizontal coordinate. That's not relevant. Okay, that's, that, and that's not required. You can represent it as a function of this vertical coordinate. Okay? So it, it, if, it, if it really helps you, then, you know, turn it that way. <laughs> okay, good. Any question about this? Yes? Why can you not include the endpoint when you say something? Because... because uh, we're, we're using an open ball. So that, that open ball, when you, when you slice it, it, it won't, it doesn't get, pick up that point. Yes? If you were excluding anything that has a self-intersection, because we could never... Okay, good. I, I'm going to get to that in just a moment, but is everybody okay with this uh, now? So fi finally, what I want you to observe, that no matter which red point we select, do, do you... Do you uh, agree that we could take some green ball, cut out a piece, and then always represent that piece as either a function of the horizontal coordinate or as a function of the vertical coordinate, no matter where we do it. So my question for you is, is, is that what is the name of this M? It is, a, it is a blank manifold, and MFLD is the usual abbreviation of manifold. So this is a blank manifold in, uh, in blank. Yeah, so this is a one manifold in R2. So now we're giving names to that loose, loose concept that I was saying before. One dimensional world sitting inside of a two dimensional universe. So the, 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 the proper math name for this is to say that it's a one, a one manifold sitting inside of R2 or embedded in R2. Good. So let's have, a, let's have a, some, uh, a non example. So, for example, uh, how about <coughs> right? How about f of x is absolute value of x? Let's look at let's look at at, at the plot of that, uh, and just ignoring the the axes for a moment and draw, just drawing it like this. So is this, if, if this was going to be one of the kinds of things that we're talking about, it, it would have to be a one-dimensional manifold in, uh, in R2, but, uh, but is it? It isn't. Why is it not? It's not smooth. Right? This is not C1. So specifically, at that, that one point is enough to say that, no, nah, it's not going to work. So to, to help you get in, in, intuition about this, uh, it, it's good to think, what would it be like to be a little creature walking around on there? Is it true that at every point uh, uh, on the red, it would, it would be like sitting on a, cop a copy of the real line? And the answer is, well, if you're away from here, that's true. But when you get there, uh, you know, it's a catastrophe happens if, if you were walking around over here and then, you know, boom, something, something happens. Uh, another example, mm, non-example. 
is say uh, this. So why is this not uh, not uh, a smooth manifold? Yeah. I don't understand. Yes, yes. Be, a, a, every every function that is ck, where k is more than where k is more than one, is also c1. So like c c c3 is a strict subset of c1. Uh, well, what I want you to observe is that this point right here, that point where there's this self intersection. Uh, I want you to imagine cutting out a ball. Select a ball centered there and make the radius as small as you want. As small as you possibly can make it. If you were to do that and you were to zoom way in with your calculus eyeball, what would you see? <laughs> You'd see exactly the same thing, right? And what I want you to observe is that no matter how no matter how small of a, of a ball you select, it's always going to be this way. It's always going to be this way. And this, if, you know, this sitting inside of, of R2, do you observe that uh, this, this cannot be uh, a function of the horizontal coordinate? It, it cannot be a function of the vertical coordinate either. Okay, so this, this is a, not, not, a, not a manifold. Any question about that? Good. <clears throat> so, the question is, is that, uh, in, in a sense, yes? It's not, it's not the kind of manifold we're talking about. It's not a smooth, it's not a smooth, that picture. If it was going to be anything that we want, we would have wanted it to be a smooth one-dimensional manifold embedded in R2, but, it, but it's not one of these. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, the, the question is, is, you know, how are we going to get, how are we going to get uh, manifolds? How are we going to get lots of examples of manifolds? So one really, really fruitful way is that you can, given any function that you know, <laughs> any function at all, uh, the graph of that function, uh, well, any C1 function, the graph of that C1 function is automatically a manifold. Right? Because you can take the open set, <laughs> you know, if it's defined, if it's domain of definition is an open set, then it's automatically one. Okay. Uh, so, Here's the theorem. So let, so it, it has two parts to it. Let uh, U, a subset of Rn, be open. Uh, let uh, big F from U to Rn minus K be C1. Okay, so now I have, I have a question for you. <laughs> what, uh, what, what notable theorem recently uh, starts out with exactly this phrase? Not that one, the other one. The implicit function theorem. The implicit function theorem. So, so the inverse function theorem, what does it require about domain and range? For the inverse one? They have to be the same, right? So it has to be like from R5 to R5, 10 to 10, that kind of thing. Whereas this one is taking vectors with lots of components and um, as input and producing 
vector, vectors with less components as output. So this is something like R3 to R1 or R, R10 to R4, something like that. Uh, so. Well, the, in, the inverse function theorem says that if you have a function defined on an open set and the domain and range have the same dimension, and if this function is differentiable, and if at the point you're interested in, the, the, the matrix which represents the derivative is invertible, then the function is locally invertible there. Okay. <coughs> uh, so, let... <coughs> Let uh, M uh, be a subset of Rn uh, given by, uh, let M be a subset of Rn such that this is true. Uh, M intersect U is uh, the set of all Z in U such that this function f evaluated at z is equal to zero. Okay, <clears throat> so that's interesting. Uh, if uh, the derivative of big F <coughs> derivative of big F evaluated at Z is surjective. What does that mean? Right, okay, so if, if you look at the matrix representation uh, of, the, of the derivative, it'll, it'll, have, it'll have some rows, and what, what this is saying, in a sense, is that uh, every row would have a, would have a pivotal one uh, it, once, you, once you put it in a reduced row echelon form. That also means, surjective uh, in that case, means that, in a sense, you're covering the entire uh, output space. Everything is reachable. So if this is surjective uh, for all z, and M intersect U, <coughs> then M intersect U is a smooth k-dimensional, well, I'll say a smooth k-manifold. That would be better, shorter. Smooth k-manifold. in Rn. Okay. <clears throat> if uh, every Z in M has such a U and F, then the entire thing M is a smooth k dimensional k manifold uh, in Rn. Okay, so we, all, all, all that we've done is stated <laughs> the theorem, right? What a mouthful. So let let's see if we can uh, if we can make sense of this. Let, let's try and make sense of it. And, and, this, and this is part one. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So, uh, well, suppose that we're sitting inside of Rn, but remember that, uh, you know, things being what they are, I can only really effectively draw two-dimensional pictures and a little bit three-dimensional pictures. So here is uh, some set. And uh, 
there's nothing really special about the way I drew that. I just wanted to draw something that couldn't possibly be a, a, a function in the college algebra sense. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, suppose we have some set U. So now U is an open subset uh, is an open subset of R n. So that means that because I've drawn a two-dimensional picture, then U is going to look like a two-dimensional open set. Okay. So then, what, what's the what's the what's the character uh, what's the stereotypical open set in R n? A ball. So. <clears throat> What this is saying is that let's, let's choose a, a particular point, say this point. So we've picked out our favorite point uh, Z here. Picked out our favorite point Z. And uh, well, even we haven't picked out our favorite point Z. Rather, what we've done is we <laughs> I, had it, I had it backwards, actually. We, we've taken this set U. And we've intersected it with the red set M. So it is like we took the whole red world, in this picture, a one-dimensional world sitting inside of a two-dimensional universe. Then we took a two-dimensional open set and surgeried away part, part of the world. And we're going to look very closely at what, what has happened with our, with our calculus eyeball here. You would see. <coughs> Uh, something that looks like this. So now, what, what the definition goes on to say, it goes on to say, now, for all of the points in here, and what is this, what is this uh, in the definition? What are we looking at here? This is the intersection, right? This is M intersect U. So now, what, the, what, the, what, this, what this theorem is saying is, now t consider this piece that we cut, that we cut out, and imagine being a creature at any point at all on, on, on this set. So for example, right here. So in the first place, uh, we need, uh, what, the, what the theorem is saying is that if you're at su such a point, uh, then the uh, what am I trying to say? Then the world looks flat. You could uh, you could if if we were omnipotent, we could replace uh, the red world with with this blue world. And and as long as the creature didn't stray too far from from that point, they they would be none the wiser. Uh, furthermore, furthermore. What is, what is this requiring? So in particular, this. So what, I, what I'm trying to get you to, to see for a moment is that you know, this is, the, this is the tangent space, and I've done my best to draw a picture, but understand that this, this conceivably could be a five-dimensional tangent space. Okay, I just couldn't possibly draw such a thing. What df evaluated at z is saying, it, it's telling you how this tangent space is situated. It's telling you how it's situated. What does it mean for it to be on to? Okay. Well, we we need it to exist. It's definitely going to exist because it's C1. So now there there are some some fun for an, an example of a C1 big F, uh, a big F that's C1 uh, that's not onto everywhere is the is the is the very trivial function where you plug in any vector and then the output is zero. <laughs> so that function is continuous and differentiable. You can take as many derivatives as you want. All, always, always zero. Okay, but it's not onto anywhere. It's not onto anywhere. Or 
right. It means that it means that uh, we will end up spanning all of the output space. We'll end up spanning all of the output space. Good. So, uh, in particular, what this is going to mean is that uh, if we take this space, which is R n, which is R n, it is possible. to do something like say, well, all of this is Rn. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to say that here we're going to single out k variables. So here's, <laughs> I hope you, you, you understand that th this whole space is Rn. And this horizontal axis represents k of the variables. So the vertical axis is representing how many of them? In minus k. So drawing, drawing this kind of contrived picture like this means, means that not only is there a tangent space, but the tangent space is not horizontal, never becomes horizontal. That's what onto means in this picture. That means that, you know, you can always go up and down. <clears throat> well, what is that the, the, the setup for? The implicit function theorem. So, if, if this is the case, if this is the case, then, uh, so the idea here is that when this is true, when all these conditions are true, there exists a little f from rk to rn minus k Uh, such that the graph of this F is M intersect U. Okay, that's interesting. So here's, here's the main idea. We're talking about sets that, that you, can, you can always cut them into, into uh, little bits where on, on each little patch you can invoke the implicit function theorem. Okay, so then globally it can, be, it can be wild and crazy like this one. But if it's true that at every point, at every point you can, you can cut out a little piece of it and then more or less invoke the implicit function theorem there and say that, oh, locally it's actually the graph of some function Ah, this is the kind of thing we're talking about when we say manifold. Good. So that's part one of the theorem. <laughs> part two. And I'll just, I'll, I'll, suffice, it, I'll suffice it to say that uh, suppose that M is a uh, smooth K-manifold in Rn. So the, 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 the previous statement, part one, was saying, suppose that we have a set that has all these very nice properties, that when you cut it, uh, it can be seen as as uh, where, where big F is some, some function big F is equal to zero and all these, all these little bits. Suppose that we have a set that has all of these very specific properties. Then that set is a K-manifold. Now what we're saying is that suppose you have a K-manifold. What are we going to say? 
<laughs> yeah, then you have all these, then you have, then, then you can do exactly the same thing but in reverse. Okay. <clears throat> Right, uh, yeah, in, in, in that way. Uh, then, every uh, for, for every, let's write a for every. For every Z and M, there exists a ball of radius epsilon centered at Z uh, <clears throat> and a C1 mapping and F uh, from this ball uh, centered at Z to our N minus K uh, such that, uh, and this is C1 Uh, such that M intersect the ball of radius epsilon at Z is uh, the set of all inputs uh, W in the ball of radius epsilon centered at Z such that this F evaluated at W is zero. And df evaluated at uh, w uh, in, uh, in there uh, is surjective, etc. Okay, so we've run out of time, but here's here's the here's the upshot. What a manifold is is it sort of like you you take calculus two and you say graphs are wonderful. I like graphs of functions. But I also like the surface of the Earth, which, which isn't a function. It's not a function. But I want to be able to deal with it. And the reason why I'm going to be able to deal with it is that if I were to just cut away a piece of the Earth, just a piece, then locally it's a function. And everything that has that property, we're going to collect all those together and call those things manifolds. Okay, have a nice uh, Tuesday. Thank you.